from the SiliconANGLE Media office in Boston, Massachusetts. It's the Cube. Now here's your host, Stu Miniman. Welcome to a special presentation in the Cube here from the Wikibon office in Marlboro, Massachusetts. Happy to welcome back to our program Paula Long, who is the co-founder and CEO of Data Gravity. Paula, always great to see you. Good to see you too, Stu. All right, so Paula, uh, you, know, you know the storage industry has been going through so much change recently. Uh, we just finished the Dell's kind of merger acquisition of EMC, the largest acquisition uh, in the enterprise tech space. Uh, we've seen over the last couple of years, Pure Storage IPO'd, Nutanix IPO'd, um, you know, big companies, small companies, lots of changes going on. Uh, to tell, tell us what's happening uh, in your world. So, um, storage has gone through great transformations and there's some amazing storage companies out there with a rich set of features. Um, when Data Gravity first came out, actually we were in the storage arena. We were adding security and data intelligence to storage. Then back in 2012, 2011, storage was still um, maturing in its ability to both have enough IOPS to handle rich applications and to be able to handle the computes. Um, so when we came out, we came out as a storage array. Um, we got to market, we had some great success, but we learned during that success is storage is going to continue to commoditize. Um, the places where people are going to be investing in storage are really going to be in the all flash or in the converged. Um, and for the intelligence in storage, people want that ubiquitous across all their storage. So we took the bold move to say, you know, instead of competing with the storage vendors, let's partner with them and the security vendors, and let's bridge the gap between security and data. Because it's sort of ridiculous that when you talk to security people, they know nothing about data. And that's a, kind of an overstatement, but not untrue. You talk to the data people, and they know nothing about security. So we said, you know what? Where our sweet spot is marrying those two. Let's come out and, and you know, let's all be friends. We don't sing Kumbaya, but let's all come out and uh, put that all together. And that's our new company has taken the same value proposition we started, um, and we've basically merged it with um, being able to go across all virtual storage now. So 100% of the virtual storage out there can be secured, and you can get data and Linux out of it. Oh. Very simply, very quickly. Yeah, so, so Paula, you were, you, it's not like you went from an appliance to now software-defined storage. You are a service that works with storage, correct? Yeah, so I think um, there's a ton of really good software-defined uh, storage out there. There's not a ton of good Actually, there's very little really good data security companies out there, and we decided that it's better to partner with best in breed and add what they don't have and instead of duplicating them. I've had this saying for years that if you can't differentiate in something and be the best of it, then you shouldn't do that piece and you should invest in the places where you're the best. And we're one of the best. I mean, like obviously, I'm not unbiased in data security, and, and that's where we doubled down. Okay, so, so Paula, what environments can you fit into? Is that like uh, the VMware vSAN and, uh, you know? All storage is virtualized. One? Okay. So if you've got uh, Nutanix, we have Nutanix customers who have virtualization. We have Nimble customers, Tentree, um, vSAN. So, so it's virtualization at the host side, not the storage side. That at, well, we actually about. virtual, basically what happens is um, with our product, you can either look at it from the storage side and just connect to a VM, or you can look at it from the virtualization side from the VM manager. So think about how Veeam has revolutionized backup for VMs. Yeah. We're re revolutionizing security for VMs. So our manageable object is a VM. So basically, you point us at a VM and you say secure it. And we'll go through and we'll do all the data sensitivity tracking. We'll look at all the activities that are happening to and from the clients from that data. Um, and we'll give you a full map of where your data is at risk, we can help you with what's something we call behavioral-based data protection. So everybody thinks about data protection in the storage space as some time-based thing, and they talk about RPO and RTO. But really what you want to talk about is um, time is great, but events are better. So you really want to be able to take a, a snapshot of what's going on when something's about to get into trouble. So you want to have a preemptive snapshot. So we have behavioral-based data protection where we can actually watch activities on your VMs and in your storage and take protective points on it. Yeah, and Paul, to your point earlier, the storage people, traditionally, they knew that security was an important thing, but you know, I think back 15 years ago when network storage, when you were like doing the Equalogic stuff, it was, can we lock the cabinet and, and make that secure? You know, physical security yep. we kind of got, but uh, when, it, when it got to the logical pieces, uh, security was important, but tended from a budget standpoint to get kind of pushed to some other port of the organization. So who's making the decision? You know, who were, who were you talking to? And, and how does your solution kind of get into the environment? So there's really two customers. The IT people who are worried about things like ransomware, since we help with that and we can talk about that. Um, and then there's all the security people who are interested 
and in, we're working really in the small and medium enterprises, and oftentimes they're the same people. But they're worried about sensitive data, they're worried about insider threat, they're worried about data dumping. Um, I have, and this is way more fun, because when I was doing storage, I was talking about my snapshots are better than your snapshots, who cares? Or I can do more IAPs than you can, so you can go zero to 60, now what? Right, or I can go really fast to get milk. Um, and so now I get to talk about your data is a crime scene. So it's really kind of fun. It's like a CSI episode every day. Like people are stealing your data there. There's indecent exposure. The raincoat's opening all the time with credit cards and IP data leaking out. Um, there's exploitation. There's stuff going to the cloud that violates all of your internal controls. And so we get to help customers understand if that's happening stop it and then monitor it doesn't happen again. Yeah, Paula, I mean, I, I agree. The criticism of the storage industry is always, you know, we, we talk about it's like, oh, it's the, the latest, greatest new feature, it's the speeds and feeds. Uh, you know, is that still a problem out there or have we solved most of the big, hairy storage issues? I think, um, so I'm a big fan of like companies like Nutanix who are actually adding DevOps. Yeah. So we've, we've, we've solved a lot of the security issues, but we haven't solved the application issues that live on top of the security, on the data. So guys like Nutanix who've come out with the Converge Play are adding DevOps, are adding security. Other people are starting to follow suit. But you know, dedupe, it's done. Everybody's got it. You mine might be better than yours by a few percentage. It'll depend on what kind of data you have. Snapshots, you know, it's been done. Application integration, you know, for, you know, application aware, whatever. NetApp uh, made a lot of money on it, invented it. Everybody's done it now. Um, there's still new stuff, don't get me wrong, there's still new stuff moving up the stack, but it's moving up the stack, right? And you know, you're gonna get faster flash, you're gonna get faster interconnects, um, and there'll be some innovation there. But if a customer needs 30,000 ops and you can do a million, the fact that you could do two million, I don't know how interesting that is. I mean, it's cool, don't get me wrong, it's cool, but I'm not sure how interesting it is from a real life perspective. And so now what you've done is, now you've got all this data that's you know, at risk and someone's gonna protect it. And, and protecting is both virtual threat as physical threat. And storage, like you said, is really worried about physical threat. Worried about people and virtual threats. Okay, so what, what are the biggest threats uh, from kind of the data and security standpoint? You mentioned ransomware, uh, what, what, what else? Yeah. S sensitive data, yeah. and then it's amazing how many people don't understand that the data they wrote, they don't own, right? So there's a lot of data dumping, so when someone's leaving a company, you see a lot of IP leaving. There's a, an awful lot of sensitive data exposure, you know, credit cards. I joke around that we see dead people. We had somebody who had um, corner files and a public share. Um, so there's a lot of data that's exposed that's not supposed to be exposed. There's a lot of permission issues. Um, and then there's just an awful lot of, um, you need to be able to trace for regulatory concerns. So it used to be you could get audited, you'd give them a big stack of paper, you know, they'd check you off. Now you gotta prove that you did what the audit said it's supposed to do in regulatory industries, and we help you with that as well. Okay, uh, and there's a lot of discussion in the industry about just you know massive amounts of data. How much data do we keep? What do we get rid of? How do we use analytics on all of them? Uh, and you know, security seems to be almost a little bit subservient to some of those other you know issues. Yeah. So what we have in within the product itself is we can show you how much of your data we call dormant, which means it hasn't been read or written for whatever period of time you said. How much of your data is duplicate? We do hashes on all of your files. Um, content, and so we can tell you how many duplicates you have, and then we can tell you how many files, we call it zombie, so the data's around but the person's not there anymore, so it's like dead data that's sort of living there taking up space, and so we help you, because part of security is don't have assets that have problems that you don't need, right? So there's a cost benefit for getting rid of it, but there's a security benefit for getting rid of it, because a lot of this dormant data has, um, do you know what, a lot of people used to have their driver's license was their social security number. Yep. A lot of places you used to do when you get your student ID it was your social security number. So a lot of this old data has really scary stuff in it, right? Um, and it hasn't been read or written in years, but it's sitting out there ready to be stolen. Yeah, so Paula, uh, you know, s some security is really an insurance to make sure that something happens. Some of it's cost savings and some of it can actually make, you know, our, our business money. Wh wh where does your solution fit? Um, we like to think about it in two, in two phases. We help you get your data um, house in order. So we help you with you know, data that should really be cleaned up, data that should be secured. And then we monitor and take action when um, anomalies happen once you've gotten it cleaned up so that we, we help you get into a good data state and then we help you stay there. So we're, we're, we're bridging both sides because we think both sides are important. Because if you've got a petabyte of data but you only need 100 terabytes, you've lost quite a bit of um, you know, just, just economics there. But also you've, you've exposed yourself because the more you have, the more people can probably steal. Okay, uh, what about things like containers? Is that having an impact on, uh, on what you're seeing? 
So what we see in containers is they're mostly used for microservices. And I'm a big fan of you know, decomposition. I'm a big fan of microservices. The problem with these is they all want to be stateless, right? And data, last time I checked, data has never been stateless. So we don't have a lot of customers who are trying to access data um, at, the, at the volumes that we talk about just yet running with containers. So we don't see a lot of questions for containers. We do see a lot of questions for the cloud because people still want to make sure that when they migrate data to the cloud that they're not migrating anything that has um, regulatory, even if you can, they've got policies inside that don't allow them to. And they also want to make sure that when someone says, where is all my data, they have a full view. We have a dashboard that'll let you see what's on-prem and in the cloud and we'll let you see everything that's going on in your data. So that's that's also helpful. Okay, and, and customers, we the, the, the word gets thrown out hybrid. What we, we always see is uh, customers are using SaaS and increasingly more, uh, mm -hmm. they're using public cloud and then they've got their own data center stuff. Do, do you view across all of that or uh, how does that work? So we're more on-prem and then things that are moving to the cloud, but we're not really looking at SaaS, at SaaS apps yet. Okay. Um, is that something, uh, you know, if I think about kind of my security and my data, is that, that it, is there somebody that's attacking that piece of it or? It's, it's being, the SaaS vendors themselves are actually putting some of that in there. And then you see some people with Office 365, which is sort of a SaaS app, yeah. but um, I guess it is um, in the broadest sense. And Salesforce is where people are kind of focusing where there's a lot of data. But a lot of that data comes back to being on-prem or into a, a backup for a cloud repository as well. Okay, uh, you mentioned Office 365. Microsoft's been ma making huge moves over the last year or so. They've got Azure Stack coming out next year. Uh, we've got coming up soon Amazon's big show. You know, yep. how, how's the public cloud impacting kind of your business and what you're hearing from customers? So it's funny, we have not now, we're targeted at regulatory customers in the small and medium enterprise. And you know, very rare do we get asked about um, the cloud, and when we do get asked about the cloud, we get asked about how do I know if I move my backup to the to the cloud that there isn't I haven't moved some sensitive data there. Um, the other question we get sort of interesting is on the backup side is um, you ever watch the movie Groundhog Day where the sure. same thing happens over and over again? Over and over. <laughs> they they want to start to analyze their backups because <laughs> you know if there's a virus in there, they don't want to restore the virus. Yeah. Um, if they've just cleaned up all the sensitive data, they don't want to restore. So they've asked us to start looking at the backup as well, so that when you restore, you don't re redo what you just cleaned up. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, the, the, the stats we've heard is, you know, most people, it, it, what's it, six months after you've been infiltrated by some security uh, problem is when you find it. Mm -hmm. um, how do people clean up? Uh, you mentioned, you know, uh, that issue, you know, ransomware, uh, some of these, you know, how do we make sure we remediate af after all that's been yeah. done? So, fortunately, unfortunately for some, some customers we've worked with, is they've been hit by ransomware, and so I've had the opportunity to look at a ransomware crime scene. So when talk, people talk about ransomware, they talk about stopping it, which is incredibly important. What they don't talk about is, okay, so go, let's go look at what just happened. Um, and it looks a little bit like data in a blender. If you actually look at the file structure after ransomware's hit, they've renamed stuff, they've hidden stuff, they've um, moved stuff around. And so when you look around, and they've created files as well, and you can imagine them contaminating some of those files so you can get it back. So a lot of the things that remediate, unless you're going to do a, um, a full restore, which means you're going to lose data, um, leaves a lot of this stuff around. What our product does is it helps you get a view of what happened and helps you sort of clean up and come up with what I would say is the action plan on restoring. Because sometimes when you get ransomware, what you want to do is just restore the files of the person who got hit. But that person probably, the ransomware software is pretty fast. It could probably have hit, you know, in a couple of seconds, it's hit thousands to ten thousands of files. The rest of your organization's probably changed twenty files. So sometimes it's better to roll back to the point before the ransomware hit, and then just apply all the clean data back. And sometimes it's the reverse. But you need to understand and get a blueprint. It's like anything else. When you're fighting a battle, you got to kind of see what just happened and kind of see what move you want to make. And our products help you do that. So because we understand data, we can understand how to restore it. Because restore from a backup is one way to do it, but you're going to lose a lot of data. So, uh, th th it's been said that uh, you know going forward, everybody's going to be a software company. Y you're now running a software company. You've run infrastructure companies. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, lessons learned, thing that you t talk to people that are starting a business or you know looking at being a software business. What would you what would you say to them? I say we're having a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, the ability to do assessments is much easier because you're not shipping equipment. Um, the problems you're solving are more business related problems with more nuances. And the, probably the most important thing is the ecosystem you're going to go into. So we're working really hard to tie in with a lot of the security and the storage infrastructure. 
So, for example, we, we partner with um, Phantom Cyber for their playbook software. We, um, with, with uh, Phantom Cyber, we can actually, you know, integrate with uh, Carbon Black for Endpoint. Um, we integrate with Nutanix on the storage side. Um, we integrate with all the SIMs for the reporting. Believe it or not, Slack is how people want to get notifications these days, right? Remember, it used to be first it was my email, then it was first it was your pager, then it was your email, then it was some kind of messaging. Now they want to get it on Slack, so we integrate with Slack to send um, your IT messages over to Slack that you have security issues. Um, so it's sort of interesting. So it's a much bigger ecosystem that you have to live in, and you have to look at you know, have a pretty big data surface and you have a network surface, and so you got to make sure that you're cooperating if you want to win in sort of a security fight. Yeah, absolutely. We've been having conversations recently about IoT is going to take that surface area and increase it even more. We saw with the recent DDoS that that leaves us open to a lot of security challenges. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so you're going to actually see, uh, it'll be interesting to see how much of the network security stuff makes it into you, like your car fabric, right? Because if you think about what they're going to do with the new cars, is there going to be a whole fabric that's um, a network fabric that all your, can you imagine somebody like, doing an attack on your motor and selling it to shut off? Yeah, they're going to they're gonna get all this right, but they're going to probably leverage a lot of the IT infrastructure security that's already out there about um, how you segregate networks, how you do things with traffic, how you, but even that's not foolproof. Yeah, I, I think the, the term I've heard is that the perimeter's dead uh, because you, you need to have per pervasive security. Yep. The perimeter's dead for two reasons. You need pervasive security and the bad guys aren't always on the outside. Yeah. Um, and the bad guys on the inside may not be bad guys, they just may not be informed people, so they could be making mistakes. And it doesn't have to be deliberate, but I don't think anybody, if the data is gone, I don't think you really care whether they did it on purpose or not. That's just a legal aspect of it. You still got to figure out how to fix it and get it back. Yeah, I, I'm curious. They, they used to always say that you know the best security policies, if you have someone that is lazy and malicious on the inside, uh, they could get in. It seems that there's a lot more external actors that can get to those people, or you know they do phishing, they do uh, various ways to get in. So there just seems to be threats from a lot more areas. There, you're, um, you know, if you were to look at Dine, it was sort of like if you had a, if you'd done a war movie with special effects, it was incoming from all games. If you were playing Risk, yeah. you're the one guy, and everybody else was ganging up on you. Um, and they did an amazing job. They did an absolutely amazing job of their, I don't know whether companies would have gotten you up and running, but you know us infrastructure folks, no single point of failure, guys. No single point of failure, which means even your SaaS company needs two DNS providers, needs two um, cloud providers, needs two independent networks to different places. Remember, you know no single point of failure, right? Yeah. Now the number of failure places are bigger, yeah. right? When you're on-prem, you kind of knew the number of failure places. Now you got to figure out what are all the s points of failure and you can't have no single point of failure. Yeah, pa Paula, you were quoting uh, Brian Cantrell in a recent blog post that you wrote talking about, you know, software, you know, it can't fail. Yep. It just needs to work. Uh, I, I fall back, uh, the old line we've heard many times is, you know, hardware will eventually fail and software will eventually work. So, <laughs> you know, wh what does that mean to the software <laughs> vendors? Um, you know? I actually believe if you're doing enterprise software, um, y you're probably not going to get six nines, but you got to get as close as you can mm -hmm. because really, Everything is running on software now, and so if it fails, you could take a business out, right? Um, and so you just need to make sure it's it's not you're going to take, you know, the old days of your desktop and you're going to reboot it. All right, I lost five minutes. It's not so bad. If you take a business out for five or ten minutes, that's not such a good thing because you've got hundreds of thousands of people who aren't working. Yeah. So. We're getting towards the end of the year here, and every year, Dave Vellante, you know, my, my, my CEO here, uh, would say, you know, do I feel more or less secure than I did before? Uh, I don't think there's too many people that would say they feel more secure here in 2016 than we did in the past. Uh, are we, you know, oversensitized to everything that's going on and getting all the alerts, or you know, what, what is the state of security? Um, I'm writing a blog post now, and what I one of the things I'm writing about is it used to be that, you know, the guys who were doing attacks were doing it for fun and to prove they could. Now they figured out how to monetize it. So now there's money in it. And so I think you're going to see more creative attacks and you're going to see people taking over not just the data but devices. Um, and that's unfortunate, but it's it's coming to become a lucrative business. So I think we're a little less secure than we were until we figure out how to get a handle on it. So I was hoping to be more of a, a bright of sunshine, yeah, so, so but... Paula, pa pa we, we, we need to leave it on a happy note. Uh, what's exciting you, uh, you know, either cool things you're seeing or uh, something that you're looking forward to going forward? So the really cool thing is, first of all, I think that what I just talked about is going to get handled because the vendors more than ever are coming together to work together to, to provide APIs to each other so you can cover that full surface. And so I think well, no one company can solve the problem, but as the companies start to work together, you're going to have a much better 
um, defense and, and some offense. You're going to start to see people starting to launch some offense, right? And I think that's going to be kind of kind of interesting. But I think it's going to um, it's going to be an, it's going to be a fun year because I think we're going to start to move more and more into higher level solutions, and the infrastructure team is going to start to lead some of that. Awesome. Well, Paul, if people want to hear more, I know you're writing on the Data Gravity blog. Any other places they should be looking? Um, tune into the Data Gravity events and blog, and you'll find out, you know, what I'm kind of we're up to and what I'm up to. All right. Well, Paula, always a pleasure to chat with you. Great, uh, you know, broad spectrum of topics uh, happening in kind of the data and security space. Uh, be sure to check out siliconangle.tv for lots of our coverage at uh, the event here as we wrap up 2016 and head into a very busy 2017. Uh, thank you to Paula Long, Data Gravity, and thank you for watching theCUBE. Thanks for having me.